Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening. And first of all, new listener shout out. So welcome to uh, Diana, um, Enid, Nichols, um, Sada, Tiff, Madison, Angie, and Bill and Greg and Kelly, welcome to the podcast. And I'm so glad that you guys are joining me. And I also want to thank everybody who is listening. Thank you so much for joining uh, me on your homesteading and gardening journey. So today's podcast episode, we're continuing with our mini training series about intensive gardening. And this one, we're talking all about cover crops for your homesteading home garden. So without further ado, let's dig in and start talking about how these beautiful plants can actually help improve our garden. But first you might be thinking, what is a cover crop? Well, a cover crop is also known as a green manure, and it is basically an unharvested crop that is grown as part of normal crop rotation within a garden, and it helps to improve the soil. But they don't just help to improve the soil. There's actually a number of ways that cover crops help our gardens. So they help to improve crop production. They help to improve soil fertility. They help to conserve water and improve water quality, believe it or not. Um, They help to decrease pesticide and herbicide use. Um, They improve nutrients that are available for use by plants. They help to prevent soil erosion. They can improve water efficiency like used by the crops that are grown in those spaces afterwards. And they can help provide habitat for wildlife and pollinators. But how do they do this? Because cover crops are just plants, right? Well, they help to increase organic matter in the soil. And living roots of cover crops hold together soil particles, especially sandy soils. And then there's other type of roots that can help to penetrate hard hard pan clay and help create these natural water passages in the soil. And this means that water filters into the soil and doesn't run off the garden bed and onto pathways or worse into our waterways. And there's certain cover crops, particularly those that are legumes, and these are natural fertilizers, providing a source of nitrogen to the soil. Other cover crops have long roots, which reach really deep into the soil and pull up nutrients from deep down, allowing other crops to use these nutrients when they die off. And cover crops for gardens help to trap excess nutrients that might be washed away in winter and help to provide a source of nutrients for spring crops. And they can provide food sources for pollinators and beneficial predatory insects, which help to support um, that permaculture technique technique called integrated pest management and this technique means that you can ditch the pesticides and herbicides and nature is going to help with pest control so things like predatory wasps or wa- uh, lace wings ladybirds or ladybugs as they're called here in the US and even birds like birds can be beneficial in a garden right especially if you have um, caterpillars or hornworms on your plants like birds can really help control those. Um, And some cover crops for gardens naturally deter pests in the soil, like soil nematodes. Um, For some of you, particularly those of you who are listening in the southern states, there are certain bad soil nematodes which can wreak havoc on some of your crops. Um, And some cover crops can actually help control these. And the food for pollinators, believe it or not, can even help to increase your plant yields and harvests from the garden, which kind of makes sense because if you've got more um, pollinators kicking about in the garden, then they're going to be pollinating more flowers, especially those that are on your veggie crops. So if you're growing lots of things like beans, peas, um, squashes, um, even 
plants like uh, that are part of the nightshade family so like tomatoes peppers eggplants all of these things need insects to help pollinate the flowers and set fruit and having a place for the pollinators to be attracted into your garden and hang out is going to help improve those harvests i can't tell you um, enough about when I first got a beehive in my garden how much more my garden produced just from having bees in there and you don't necessarily need to go all out and have a beehive in your garden but you can definitely like encourage all the pollinators to your yard by having a source of food there for them Another great thing that cover crops do are smothering weeds. So weeds are kind of suppressed out of the vegetable garden by the shade canopy that's created by the cover crops. So less weeding for you, right, means that you've got more time to enjoy your garden. And, you know, I know that you guys are busy, right? You're busy at work and trying to juggle home life and everything else. So having one less thing to do in the gardens actually kind of fun, right? And um, cover crops are a really big part of what's known as nutrient cycling. And, you know, I mentioned the organic matter earlier. Well, organic matter is really the food source in soil for microorganisms. And those are things like bacteria and fungi that live in the soil. And these microorganisms break down the organic matter into smaller and smaller pieces and parts that can readily be used by your plants. And this is important because this is what is going to feed your garden it's going to feed your plants and i know that you guys who listen to this podcast on a regular basis you hear me talking about this time and time again that a good organic garden is based on amazing soil and getting that soil right means that your plants and your garden are going to flourish year after year so green manures and cover crops are basically trampled or squashed down mowed or cut and and their cuttings or plant residues are left on the soil surface um, or they could be turned under and they start decomposing and breaking down and the roots die back as well as part of this and both the decomposing residues on the surface and these dying roots in the soil help to produce the organic matter that you know feeds these microorganisms releasing more nutrients into the soil for your plants to use and then what's important about this is the the nutrients that are released into the soil are in a form that your plants prefer to take up so this is where kind of things are a little bit different from using chemical fertilizers in the garden to more natural ones ones because these more natural ones are much more readily taken up by your plants and they don't kind of interfere with the normal cycles that are happening in the soil and this cycling of nutrients is how not only soil fertility is increased in the garden but also is what improves soil structure pH and the ability to retain water in your garden soil and all of these things kind of work in combination to help your garden grow and grow better. So let's talk about what some cover crops for gardens are and what plants are cover crops or green manures and I use these two terms cover crops and green manures interchangeably and these crops do different things in the garden so they they do different things for the soil they do different things for insects they do different things um, to help your garden grow and there's lots of choice right so some common uh, green manures or cover crops are things like fava beans or broad beans it's a very common one same with soybeans red clover crimson clover daikon radish also known as tillage radish uh, phacelia vetch oats buckwheat rye and field peas are all common cover crops that are readily available from a number of different seed suppliers and really your choice of of using these kind of depends on a couple of factors um, that you need to consider for your garden so let's talk a little bit about how to use cover crops in a garden because ultimately what happens with these cover crops is they produce biomass right they they grow they're using the sun to convert um, into sugars and carbohydrates to grow they're using nutrients from in the soil to help fuel that growth 
And what you need to do is you need to um, kind of kill off these plants. So they need to be cut. They need to be bent over or trampled or turned under. And by turning under, I mean that you literally dig a garden fork into those cover crops and then you lift it up and turn it upside down so the roots are up at the top and whatever was growing was underneath. And things are going to break down and decompose right? And it's this decomposition, this breaking down that happens that is releasing these nutrients into the soil. So knowing what you're going to be planting in the space after the cover crop is going to help you decide what cover crop to use in the garden. So for example, if you're planning on planting heavy feeders, so things like corn, sorghum, squash, they're definitely heavy feeders, um, maybe even tomatoes in the space, um, then think about crops that are going to add nutrients to the soil. So things like nitrogen, right? That's, that's a common one that heavy feeding crops really like to have available. So you want to be thinking legume cr cover crops, things like clover, fava beans, cow peas or hairy vetch. These are all great cover crops to consider in that space. Some cover crops suppress plants by growing um, and they release chemicals into the soil naturally as they break down that stunts growth. Um, these plants are called uh, alleopathic or alleopathic um, plants, right? And what happens is if you're planning on growing particularly small seeded plants in the area after your cover crop, so think things like with tiny seeds like lettuce, carrot, brassicas, so plants like cauliflower, kale or Asian greens, especially for a spring garden, right? Then you don't want to be planting things like uh, rye grass or winter rye over winter in that bed because as these rye plants decompose, then these leach out these uh, stunting um, chemicals and stop these small seeds from germinating. So you might want to think things like wheat or oats instead in these areas. Timing is also really important, right? And the timing of planting cover crops in the garden um, is really key um, if you're looking at using these in your intensive garden. Because what you're wanting to do is you're wanting these plants to grow to a certain point where they've got the maximum amount of nutrients in there. And then we kill them off, let them decompose, and then we plant into that space, right? Because then we've got the maximum amount of nutrients that are available available for our plants to grow. So if you're wanting to build soil over a few months and you want to kind of really improve that garden's bed, improve that soil, the structure, the available nutrients, all that good stuff, then you want to be thinking things like grains like oats, rye, and in a mixture with legumes. So like field peas or vetch, right? And you want them in combination together. And you can create your own like soil building blend of plants for your garden bed, or you can buy a cover crop mix. And a cover crop mix is really great, especially if you're a beginner with these, because you can kind of try them out and see how they work without investing too much money. Whereas if you're trying to kind of create your own soil building blend, then you're going to have to be sourcing lots of different um, plants together and blending them up and then sowing them, right? But cover crop mixes are either sown in early spring uh, for a spring through summer c coverage of the garden bed, right? So that bed's going to be in use with the cover crop for a long period of time. Or you can sow them in uh, late summer, early fall to have coverage over winter. Let's just talk a little bit about the differences. So if you've got something that's sown in early spring for spring through summer coverage, this helps to build soil and provide habitat for these pollinators, right? So there's usually things that are going to be in flower. There's going to be like things that they can sort of forage on and set up home. Um, it's a great place for these predatory insects to um, lay their eggs and have babies and all that kind of stuff that, that's happening in a normal, you know, ecosystem, right? And other mixes, 
for like summer and fall might have things like winter rye, crimson clover and field peas in the mixture and they're sown in late summer and they help to reduce erosion of soil with um, winter rain and snow melt in early spring but they can also capture or like mop up some of these nutrients that might be leached out during um, the winter so things that are often like washed away like nitrogen this excess can be kind of captured in these winter um, cover crops and kind of held there until you know we release them back to the soil in spring by killing off um, the cover crop right so some um, cover crops for gardens actually die off in winter with the frost and uh, this is really like a really cool thing that happens with cover crops and um, tillage or daikon radish uh, like tillage radish or daikon radish right these are a really good example and these are sown in like late summer like around august for a lot of people and they they grow and they're basically left in the garden bed to die off in winter so when you get a hard frost come they die they die off and they start to break down and decay in in place and what happens is as these plants like break down and decay they leave these big old chunky holes in the soil and this is perfect for allowing water to d penetrate into that soil and this makes like these types of radishes perfect for opening up clay soils but they also pull up a lot of nutrients from deep in the soil and they actually release quite a lot of um like nitrogen into the soil along with like lots of other nutrients that they're pulling up like from deep down so you know if you want to have these kind of cover crops in place for a long period of time then you can do that but for a lot of you listening you might only have a short growing season and you can definitely use cover crops even if you have a short growing season you want things that are kind of tender right things that will um frost kill or you know they they grow rapidly so some real good crops if you're short on time are buckwheat and field peas buckwheat grows like the clappers it grows real fast and i lo love to use buckwheat in my garden and actually i've kind of let it self seed in a lot of places in, in the garden because i like that it encourages bees into the garden but what what I love about it is it grows fast it smothers weeds really quickly and peas provide a great nitrogen source and both of these crops like when you cut them they break down really quickly on the soil helping to feed those microorganisms so release releasing those nutrients pretty quickly but if you haven't gathered by now one of the keys to using these cover crops is that you have to kill them so don't feel bad about this step and it took me a while to kind of get over it because i didn't like killing off these crops you know when i first started using them but you know realistically that is what we're doing in in a garden right we're wanting things to to grow we want them to produce stuff that we harvest right and actually part of harvesting is you know that we end up killing our crops sometimes right if if we didn't harvest a carrot when it was ready then it would run to seed and we wouldn't actually have a carrot that we could eat right so don't feel bad about killing your cover crop because this has to happen to release the nutrients back to the soil microorganisms as organic matter and you know naturally in nature this is what happens all the time this is how plants release um, nutrients back to the soil right some die in because of the frost so some die in the winter others die because you know we have animals that come through and feed on them so you know think about like the bison and the great plains that's exactly what they did right you had these big herbivores coming through munching on the grasses and obviously you know pooping on there too but they were like tramping things down like you know getting it all stuck in to the mud a little bit as they're like you know migrating through and then these were breaking down and releasing you know nutrients back into the soil this this kind of happens normally and you know certainly in europe this is how some of the pastures and things are typically managed right if you look at places like sardinia um, 
um, or even Switzerland, where you have kind of traditional um, shepherding going on, they, you know, they drive, you know, the sheep or the goats or whatever they're kind of herding through to different areas and they're not grazing on that same area um you know over and over again they're being moved on to different areas to allow you know those grasses and plants to recover and flourish again you know in later years so that this is all pretty normal right and and this is kind of what happens when we're trying to do cover crops in a garden, right? There is actually an ideal time to kill off a cover crop and it's usually before it produces seeds. Now, seeds take up a lot of energy to make, right? So you need to keep an eye on your garden cover crops and get ready to kill them before they make seeds. And some ways that we can kill off the cover crop in the garden are mowing, uh, weed eating, weed whacking or cutting them down, right? You can tread them down so you can get like a, a, a wood board or something or just, you know, a pair of stout boots and just, just kind of tread them down, right? I mean, it's probably quite fun for kids. Just need to make sure that they're not going to be like stomping all over your precious tomato plants or anything. Um, but, you know, really kind of treading down these plants, um, you know, or chop and drop. So kind of cutting them and then, you know, dropping those residues right on place. Um, and then finally, you can dig or turn under those plants. So remember, digging them in is where we are kind of cutting them down a bit. And then we are sticking a garden fork into that soil lifting up a piece turning it upside down so those plant residues that were once growing are now uh, right up against the soil and the roots are kind of up towards the air I don't love the digging in or turning under um the cover crop um just because you know there there's a lot of more extra work that needs to be done there and i know a lot of you you're very interested in these kind of no dig techniques so mowing weed eating cutting treading down your cover crop are a really good choice um just one caution i will throw out there is with winter rye and it'll only die back if it's cut after it forms a seed head but before it releases the seeds um, but most cover crops you can kill off by one of these techniques when they start to flower and that's when they actually have the most nutrients but some of you might want to leave some flowers for the pollinators and that's okay too and you know i would sometimes leave um the cover crops to kind of be um killed off in succession so i would cut down a little bit when it was just starting to flower i would let some of it flower for a few days and then i would cut it down and then there was another bit that was kind of still flowering and i would cut that down before it produced seeds so that way i was kind of helping to bring in the pollinators to the area as well without just kind of totally you know chopping everything down and not having anything flowering to kind of bring them into the garden because that's what i wanted right i want to attract the pollinators and the beneficial bugs into the garden to help manage some of those pests and that's all going to be next week's episode is all about integrated pest management so i hope um if you're not already following this podcast and subscribing then definitely make sure that you subscribe um so you don't miss that episode so let's talk a little bit about uh, when to plant the cover crop because you know when um you are considering sowing your cover crops obviously you need to take into account if this is something that needs to be sown in winter or in spring but also you need to take into consideration when you are going to be planting in that space because after killing that cover crop there's going to be some plant residues that are going to be decomposing and you're going to need to kill off your cover crop at least two weeks before you plan to sow or transplant your edible crops into that garden space but four weeks is more ideal because worms and other soil workhorses are going to be pulling these plant residues into the soil right they're going to be producing that organic matter turning it into smaller parts that those microorganisms organisms are going to continue to break down more so getting an understanding of what it is that you are planning to plant how long it takes to grow and actually there's a lot of information in the seed catalogs now about how long things take to grow and when the ideal time to cut these crops down 
uh, is going to be is all kind of listed in a lot of the good catalogs now. So that's really, really handy. And, you know, when you're thinking about your garden, um, especially if you're new to this podcast, one of the things that I always say is to plan your garden on paper first. And this is why this is becomes important because you can kind of take a look at, okay, this plant's going to take 60 days um, to grow to maturity. And then after that 60 days, I want to be um, killing off this cover crop and then I need to leave it another 14 days or um, a month before I can then plant whatever the crop is going to be in there. So if you know your days to maturity and you read your seed packets and things well, you can start to kind of plan out on paper what's going to be in that garden bed and you can start to plan not only like starting your seeds indoors, but also when things are going to need to be cut down in the garden so that they can start to, you know, return those residues and feed that garden soil. Now, you don't have to um, cut down a cover crop. You can just pull it out of the garden and put it into the compost. However, if you're going to do that technique, then you must, must, must put some compost that is ready to go back into that garden soil to help provide the organic matter and um, nutrients for your plants to grow. Because if you just let your cover crops grow in there and you're pulling them out and you're not replacing those lost nutrients with anything, then you're going to be depleting your soil. So that's something that you really need to be aware of. But one of the beautiful things about growing a garden is that gardening is an experiment and it's a fun experiment. And trying to grow cover crops in your garden It's a really good experiment to try doing. And, you know, you can try doing different techniques. So maybe you can try mowing some of them or digging some under or pulling them out and putting them in the compost bin and just putting compost on instead. Um, You know, keep good notes in your garden journal of what cover crops grew well in your garden and what you grew in the space afterwards and and how your treatment of killing the cover crop impacted what you grew next. Because it's understanding how your garden is growing and using the techniques that you as the gardener are putting into it, that is what is going to help you really hone in your skills, but also help your garden grow better. And that's why I love a garden journal. I did a whole podcast episode about a garden journal, but this is kind of one of these tools that, you know, successful gardeners are using all the time and it you know it's not just for kind of planning your garden but also some of these anecdotal information about how well your plants grew I mean you can get really fancy and start like weighing your harvests and stuff like that so you really know hey for this particular crop I when I mowed it I had a much 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 better harvest of whatever the plant was afterwards let's say I don't know tomatoes um, you know I had a much better harvest of tomatoes after doing that than I did of when I just trod everything down or I just added compost rather than um, you know using the green manures in that space I pulled them out and I put compost in instead but this is what's beautiful about growing a garden right there are so many different ways of growing a garden just as there are so many different people on this planet and you know that's that's the wonderful thing is your garden is just as unique as you and that's something to be treasured And I want to hear from you either in the Facebook group or you can drop me a message on Instagram. But I want to know from you, what is it that you are going to be trying for cover crops in your garden? And if you're already using cover crops, how do you use them in your garden? I would love to know. And I know that other misfit gardeners would love to know as well how they are growing in your garden. So that's it for this episode. Join me for next week's where we're going to be talking all about integrated pest management. Until next time, I hope your garden grows beautifully and I'll see you all next week.